Hello, I'm Dr. Scott Wadier. And I'm Tommy Welling, and you're listening to the Fasting for Life podcast. This podcast is about using fasting as a tool to regain your health, achieve ultimate wellness, and live the life you truly deserve. Each episode is a short conversation on a single topic with immediate actionable steps. We cover everything from fat loss and health and wellness to the science of lifestyle design. We started Fasting for Life because of how fasting has transformed our lives, and we hope to share the tools that we have learned along the way. Hey everyone, Dr. Scott here. Want to hop on real quick before we start with today's episode and let you know that our next challenge event registration link is live. It is in the show notes for dates and additional information. You can also go to www.thefastingforlife.com forward slash live, www.thefastingforlife.com forward slash live. And now to today's episode. Welcome to the Fasting for Life podcast. My name is Dr. Scott Wadier, and I'm here, as always, with my good friend and colleague, Tommy Welling. Good afternoon to you, sir. Hey, Scott. How are you? Rock and rolling, my friend, as always. Love podcast record day. Um, makes us up our game, makes us conversate, uh, listen to all the feedback and the amazing comments from all of our just incredible listeners. You guys are great. The Fasting yeah. for Life family crew. I know we've got a ton of ton of different names for all y'all out there, but uh, much love and appreciation for you guys listening, mm-hmm. continuing to conversate with us and be on this journey as well. So I just, I man, I love podcast record day. And I think, uh, I think, you know, today's going to be a good one. I'll just go out on yeah. a limb. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think so too. It's I, a big, I think... strong limb, by the way. Okay, right. Going right. out on it. Yeah. And I think you're usually hanging out on that, on that limb and I like it. It's, it's a good place. It's a, it's a place where I can always find you. Yeah, and uh, I, I, I think it's, I think it's good. It's just always, it's always fun to, you know, to kind of push the envelope and see what else we can find that has, you know, important connection points and implications for, for real life, for fasting lifestyle and, and just kind of everything in between. So I, I'm excited too. So this is a big one, um, and we'll get serious for a second here, um, and I'll set the stage with kind of a state of the union when it comes to uh, overall health in this country, mm-hmm. and you know why. I won't tell the whole story, but why personally this matters to me, and I think you have a similar uh, reference point as well. Um, but the study we're going to be kind of ta- kind of having a conversation around is a review study. Um, with 99 uh, different references throughout. And it was done in the Journal of Nutrients. And it was just, a, 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 there's so many names and amazing docs on this uh, and researchers on it. Um, but I like that it's new and that it's robust. And it really speaks to one of the you know most prevalent health related issues or health related conditions that we have in this country, which is heart health. Yeah. So I, <clears throat> go ahead. Yeah. I, I think, I think heart health is, is, I mean, it's, it's at the, it's at the core of, of everything. I mean, uh, obviously, obviously being so important in the body, but you know, I think we all know somebody who, who's had issues, you know, cardiovascular concerns, if we don't have them ourselves. And I, I think that, no matter what what age you are, that that this is going to speak to you. And the reality is, this you know, this was I was on this path too. So I'm not speaking from a soapbox. I'm speaking from experience of you know getting my blood work done for life insurance and my blood pressure being high, my triglycerides being high, my cholesterol not being where it needed to be. Yet I was the health coach who was teaching other people to get well, but not being able to do it myself. Right. So right. And then seeing you know for me personally, and uh, you know it it also hit home with my dad and my family and my family history and all those types of things. But the statistics don't lie. And one of the realizations is, you know, for me in in doing hundreds of workshops and talks in churches and businesses and, you know, in my own practice when I was in clinical practice over the years, it was always like, okay, we need to know where we are in order to get where we need to go. So the statistics don't lie. Like if you're sitting in the room and it used to be fun, funny sometimes when like women are much more Um, proactive when it comes to their health, right? So um, typically us guys are just kind of like, man, we'll be fine. It'll be fine. It'll be fine. And, you know, in, so when I was in clinical practice, you know, 70% of our new patients were women and then the husbands would come in and I'm not saying it's always that way, but um, 
you know, our radar is not as, we're not as intuitive to it. We kind of just put it off. Right. So we'd right. be sitting in these workshops and these reports and, you know, the wife would be there. She'd bring her husband and the husband would be sitting there with his arms crossed, like just kind of looking, watching, judging a little bit. Right. And <laughs> I would literally look at that person in the room and it, it, it happened in every workshop I did. And I was like, listen, if you're sitting in this room and you don't think this could be you or is going to be you, then that's the starting point. We need to have this conversation in that the statistics are real and that if you don't do something different, you're going to end up becoming one of the statistics because the results speak for themselves. And when it comes to heart disease, those results are pretty scary. And the fact that um, one person every 36 seconds dies from cardiovascular disease and 655,000 Americans each year die from heart disease, that's one in every four people, right? So that's 25%. And the costs that are just staggering, $219 billion a year, right? And wow. I mean, we're just looking at these numbers and it's like, um, you know, 18 million adults <clears throat> in the 20 age range have some form of cardio uh, coronary artery disease, which is, which is one of the main components of in the family of heart diseases. And right. then you look at the heart attack numbers too, 805,000 Americans have heart attacks every year. And it's like, 600 of those, it's their first sign of heart disease. So in one in five are silent. So you're sitting here going, okay, guys, what the heck? I'm, this is a fasting podcast. Like, why, what is going on? Like, can we, I, like, I don't want to think about this. And I'm, my encouragement is for me, it was personal because I knew I was on that path. I had my family history. My dad is an example who is now doing incredible, but heart disease is a real thing. And the amazing thing about this study this review of these 99 different articles is that there's something you can actually do about it now. Yeah. And, and I think it's also important because just like you mentioned, like the, the numbers, the ages for these studies and for those statistics is getting younger and younger and younger. Right. Cause we, we, we look at these cardiovascular studies and now they're starting to talk about people in their, in their thirties and their forties when it, it used to be, Oh, uh, this is a study about people in their sixties and their seventies and their eighties. The, the, the numbers are coming mm -hmm. down because as the overall, you know, health of, of our country and the world is, is getting worse in general, we're, we're seeing more and more prevalence of these at a, at a younger age. So, I mean, I, I think this is so important. Yeah. And just for um, overall perspective, <clears throat> we're going to talk directly on the studies and the kind of the takeaways when it comes to using fasting, uh, which is the main tool that you can do to start on doing some of this stuff and not becoming one of those statistics is, you know, heart right. disease refers to several types of heart conditions. So it's um, the, the most common is coronary artery disease, which can cause the heart attacks that we mentioned other kinds uh, may involve the valves or the heart may not pump as well, congestive heart failure. Um, there's a small proponent of people that actually are born with a heart condition. That's not kind of, that's not really what we're talking about here. Um, but, you know, anyone, including children nowadays, right, can even develop some form of heart disease. And that's really where you've got that plaque buildup and that arthrosclerosis, high cholesterol, high blood pressure, diabetes can increase your risk. So what we're talking about when it comes to fasting is, you know, not just preventing becoming one of these statistics, but preventing or undoing some of the, uh, you know, stuff that we just mentioned, right? Like you don't have to end up being in that position dealing with these things. And, you know, I don't know, Tommy, I know you were, you know, pre-med at one point and, uh, you know, working in uh, rehab clinics and working in a clinical setting. I was in a clinical setting and so many people would come in as their motivating factor of their why they were coming into the clinic was because they didn't want to end up like their grandfather or their mom or their dad or their aunt or their neighbor. Cause we all know someone that suffers with this stuff. Right. Uh, absolutely. I mean, cardiovascular, um, disorders are just, they're, they're just so prevalent. And I mean, that's, it's one of the things that, that I love about this study is just the fact that, um, the, the implications are just so, so broadly applicable to, to basically everybody. And, you know, to start laying the groundwork for it, um, when, when they're doing this review, they were looking across, uh, multiple different fasting protocols. Uh, they're using research data that that utilized 5-2 protocols, alternate day fasting or ADF protocols, um, and, and multiple other time-restricted feeding protocols. And basically just looking at those different fasting uh, methodologies and how they related to uh, different cardiovascular, um, you know, markers and different changes 
uh, that occurred during during various fasting uh, frequencies and protocols, right? Yeah, and um, it, I love that it wasn't just one type of fasting, right? <laughs> like that was one of my favorite things about yeah. this is that it looked at so many different variations, and um, the sixteen eight <clears throat> window where you fast for sixteen hours and you eat for eight. Pretty much, you skip breakfast and you eat between twelve and eight. Right. Right. Um, the immediate effects on the cardiovascular system. So decreasing the plaque buildup, uh, the benefits for the diabetes type two patient, the immediate short-term decrease in, and long-term decrease in blood pressure, um, lipid changes. So increases in benefits in your cholesterol profile and your cholesterol panel, and then also inflammation, which is the silent killer when it comes to heart disease. It's not just necessarily the cholesterol itself, but it's the oxidation of that cholesterol in the body that causes the issue. So um, when we look at the overall benefits, I mean, we could just sit here for the next 30 minutes and talk about the benefits. And I, I think I just want to highlight a few of them. And I know you had a couple you wanted to, to, to highlight as well. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I really like it. Um, when, when we start looking at the result profile and the, the result tables, um, for this study, and we, we look across, um, you know, various timeframes, um, anywhere from six weeks out to six months. Um, but what we see consistently in the results was, was, you know, decreases in the quote unquote bad markers, uh, for cardiovascular disease. Um, and you know, starting from the beginning, um, one of the questions that we get sometimes is, well, my, my total cholesterol, uh, has gone up a little bit. And, and what we see in the results is that during, um, during one of the six week studies, they did have an increase in total cholesterol, but as you got farther into, into the, uh, the results, basically three months, uh, six months, total cholesterol had decreased, uh, LDL had decreased, um, and with, with potential, uh, for, for lower triglycerides as well, um, across multiple different timeframes. So, uh, just a lot of really, really good results encouraging over, over long-term timeframes. You had mentioned something in the prep for kind of going through this. Um, and there's a lot in this one, right? So it's always yeah. like, we sit down, we're like, how can we apply this? How can this be a real life situation? Why does this matter? But you talked about, um, you know, the, the transition between that glucose to ketone switchover. Right. And there yes. was a term that you had mentioned that you said to me that I can't recall off the top of my head right now, which is sad, but you said it and you're like, I really like that. And I was like, so do I, that's something I had not heard before. Yeah, I hadn't either. And, and it's called intermittent metabolic switching. So, so literally huh? that, that sh yeah, intermittent metabolic switching. So, okay. you know, going, going from the typical carbohydrate burning, the, the, the glucose, the gly the glycolytic pathway, um, changing over from a glucose metabolism over to the fat burning or the, the, the ketosis uh, metabolism is referred to in this article and, and elsewhere in the literature apparently as intermittent metabolic switching, which, which makes sense because when we're, when we're even doing something like an 18 hour fast, we start to see an increase in ketones as the glycogen stores uh, come down as we kind of burn through the excess carbohydrates in the body during that, that 18 hour period. And then, um, into the longer fast as well. Um, so we, we, we are going through the process of, of switching over in the metabolism and, and that's okay. And that's a good thing for it to, to go back and forth, um, you know, during the process as we, as we fast, and then we break the fast and then we, we go back into our next fast. One of the short-term things too, is there was, uh, you know, that short-term increase in the triglycerides, right. But if you, well, that study as well was in the obese individual. So BMI 30 to 40. So we're talking like high level, lots of weight to lose. So you're going to have more adipocytes breaking down and more, you know, fatty acids being released into the body. So your body has to dispel that stuff. So we would naturally expect to see a shorter, a short term kind of like spike as we transition through what was the term again, intermittent metabolic switching. Switching, right? So it, it it just all makes sense that it's cool that, you know, personally we've seen it, we see it in clients, we see it in people reporting to us the changes that they see in their blood work. Um, and getting the weight off, obviously, huge benefit when it comes to heart-related issues, right? I like right. going even deeper into it when we talk about the inflammatory component or the inflammatory, the anti-inflammatory component to fasting. Um, and I had mentioned it earlier where the inflammation the oxidation of those cholesterols of those uh, components in the body is what causes a lot of the damage and the plaques to form. So 
um, when we're looking at you know some of those markers, you're going to see things like IL-6 and C-reactive protein and homocysteine. These are all things that promote inflammation, right? So even just outside of the heart related or the, the, the vasculature related, like the blood vessel related application here, um, pro infl inflammation sucks. <laughs> like mm -hmm. being in pain all the time, if you've got arthritis, if you've got joint problems, if you've got degenerative changes in your knees or your hips or your ankles or your back or your neck, like you're going to be able to undo some of these, um, uh, this, this high level of chronic inflammation. So you're just going to feel better. And that's one of the biggest things that we hear, you know, when people start fasting and we had woman in one of our challenges, one of our first challenges we did back in 2020, she's like, yeah, I'm off all my pain meds in like six weeks. Remember that? Yeah. Yeah. I do remember that. That was amazing to see like four to six pain pills a day gone. Right yeah. now. What can I expect that in two weeks? Or I think, I think that was our month when we did a 28 day challenge. Right. I think it was yeah. like at the end of those four weeks, she's like, yeah, I'm off all of them. I was like, Whoa. Right. But we know that intermittent fasting has a huge positive effect on inflammatory biomarkers, not just heart related, but also, you know, overall, uh, you know, body related and overall like quality of life related too. Yeah, I know. And, and, and speaking of the inflammatory markers, um, this, this study also sh uh, shown a light on resistant as well. And, and, oh. and just the fact, right. Yeah. The, just the, the connection to resistant and the inflammatory processes. And, and I mean, that, that's something we hadn't seen any of the research talk about before. I hadn't heard resistant. This is full transparency. Like we are no research experts here, but we, we do well, right. I feel we do pretty well mm -hmm. in finding the application and, you know, working through some of it, but like, I hadn't heard that probably since national boards, right? Like, or right. since uh, anatomy and physiology back in the day, like, I, okay, great. Yeah. I, rem I remember, right. I remember of it, right. I remember of it. kind of what it is. It's a cytokine derived, you know, from the fat cells. Right. So it's like, it's concentration, it's higher levels in the body correlate directly with insulin resistance, uh, in obesity. And it has a pro inflammatory activity as well. So, the fact that you can get resistance numbers to come down just with, you know, an intermittent window, an 18-6 window. Um, sorry, I always do that. 16-8 window, correct? Why do I always flip Either way. those two? Yeah, I know, but I always flip it. Um, it's just, it's crazy because, yeah, it, it ah, man, I, I don't want to go too far down the rabbit hole with resistance, but like when you have high levels, it increases your bad cholesterol and, and bad air quotes. And it also increases your plaque buildup in your arteries. So like huge win here, right? Like just skip breakfast. Yeah, exactly. And I mean, bringing those levels down is, is just, it's, it's cardio protective. It's, it's, it's the exact turnaround that, that so many people are looking for. I, I just, it, it's, it's so promising. I love it. Oh, excuse me. <clears throat> All right. So one of the other things, Tommy, that we, we want to talk about is the, the impact of IF on blood pressure. Right. And, um, yeah, yeah it was so cool short-term and long-term. Yeah. It, and, and this is one of the things that, that we see and we hear feedback from, from people just getting started and they, they go, I, I, I measure my blood pressure and it, you know, it, all of a sudden it, it's down. I've only been fasting for, you know, a week or two and you know, this, this study and, and many other ones, um, find that as, as one of the outcome results too, just a, a very quick, um, you know, 10 to 20 plus point reduction in, in blood pressure, just, just in a matter of, of days to weeks, um, getting started with intermittent fasting. This is one of the things that, uh, I saw, you know, when I, um, redid my life insurance, right. So it was like, started fasting, didn't, didn't have to do a re-exam or whatever they call it. I'm not in the insurance world. Um, they did something where it's like a re up or re something. And I was like, all right, fine. Come on over. Let me do it. You know, I've always been nervous about those cause I'm short. I used to be a power lifter. So I have a lot of mass. <laughs> um, you know, I, I, I don't, um, more built square than I am tall and lean. And, uh, so I've never yeah. done well on the BMI scale. I've never done well with the blood pressure over the years. Um, so I've always been nervous about it, but <clears throat> I mean, it was, she took it two or three times and it, cause she had my previous results and it was completely normal. And that was with, you know, like going through the whole process of, um, of, of being worried about it. Right. Which can raise right. it, uh, that so-called white coat syndrome. So, 
Um, it's just, it's cool because again, you're taking stress off of your cardio, <clears throat> cardio. Um, you, you're literally taking stress off of your, uh, heart and the cardiac system itself. Yeah. And, and the results of this study showed, you know, anywhere from eight weeks to six months, every single study, uh, showed a decrease in both systolic and diastolic numbers, um, whether on the short term or the long term. So, so those effects that, that we hear about, um, even in the beginning, those are, are continued throughout the process. And, you know, as, as the, as you, you continue to use intermittent fasting, um, you would expect that, that those, um, positive changes are going to stick with you. And so that, that's really super encouraging for a lot of people. I love the part one step nerd factor, one nerd level higher here, um, <laughs> is, yeah, sorry, uh, is the brain derived neurotropic factor, the BDNF. So intermittent fasting increases that, which is a direct lowering of that systolic and diastolic. So the above the, the top and bottom number of your blood pressure, right? Um, <clears throat> so it can also, um, you know, kind of calms down your vagus nerve, which is what controls your heartbeat, your pulse, your rhythm, all of that. Mm -hmm. So you're moving out of that sympathetic, you know, fight or flight type state. And it also can increase, you know, that feeling of euphoria. Like you get rid of that brain fog as well. Cause B BDNF is a really powerful, um, uh, you know, uh, side effect to a positive side effect, side effects typically taken in a, in a negative light, a positive uh, effect of, um, you know, the, uh, intermittent fasting windows, decreasing the hypertension, but you get this BDNF that does multiple things. So I just really mm -hmm. like the fact that it's, um, never mind helping with the heart side of things, but it's also <clears throat> just making you feel better. And I don't know about anybody else, but when you're 30 or 40 pounds overweight, you just don't feel great all the time. No, it, it's, it's, it's hard to, it's hard to feel good when your energy level is depressed. You're, you're, it, it's a little harder to breathe. You, you just, you just, it, it takes more work. It takes more energy and it takes more out of you to, to move around that additional mass. Like the, the, the body doesn't want to be holding on to, to more of that, more of that fat and more of the, more of the mass than, than you need. It's just not designed for it. And it puts a stress on the system. And, you know, the, the, the trouble for me personally was that I had gotten used to that additional stress. I, I didn't, I didn't really know what it was like not to have that honestly. Yeah. Waking up, thinking about when you're going to nap. Right. I used to do the same thing. <laughs> right. Be like, oh man, okay. I got a busy day. When can I sneak a nap in? Yeah. Like, I don't know. I feel like you we're probably designed to be better than that. Yeah. You just woke up. How can you be tired? Right. So yeah. I know some of this stuff we're, we're speaking a little tongue in cheek about, but um, Tommy and talking and talking through this study and just, we were like, okay, what do we talk about? Cause there's so many positive impacts. You had a really cool perspective on, <clears throat> you know, a, a major takeaway for people, um, in setting it up with the fact that stats don't lie. You may not be thinking about it right now, just like diabetes. It takes 10, 20, 30 years to show up on blood work. Same thing yeah. with heart stuff, the whole heart attack, 600, you know, thousand people a year have a heart attack. And it's that first sign of heart disease. Like talk about getting punched in the face, like not knowing it's coming, right. You have all the, the, you go and get your blood work done and your doc says you got a clean bill of health. And then 600,000 people a year, heart attack. Like what, what do you mean? So, um, the, the, the takeaway, I really liked your framing on kind of the takeaway, um, in terms of whether or not you're an experienced fast or new to fasting, uh, have a love hate relationship with it, whatever it is. <laughs> um, well, there are days where it's not so fun, right? You're trying to push your window, but yeah, I, I really liked your sure. perspective on it. Yeah. I mean, I, I really think it's, it's a matter of priorities and just understanding, um, where the statistics are headed, the, the fact that they don't lie and you know, what, what, what direction everything's been headed in, you know, just over the, the last few decades, um, you know, we all, we all probably know somebody, um, whether it's, it's family or, or a neighbor, or maybe an, um, maybe it's a parent or grandparent, you know, who's, who's battled with cardiovascular issues. Like it, these, these kind of things are, are shortening people's lives and they're making their lives a lot more tough than they, they really need to be for, a, for a lot longer than they should be. I, I, I think just, just taking a step back and, and understanding that, you know, a few simple changes, like, like a little bit of meal timing and like something as simple as just skipping breakfast and, and just understanding, I don't, I don't need to eat breakfast ever again. Um, can, can be all the difference in the world for, for having the next 
you know, two or three or four decades of life be, be just immensely better, I, I, I think is, is, is my takeaway for the whole thing. And really that, I think what you're, what I'm hearing there is you're speaking to the why. So like, why are you doing it? <clears throat> why are yeah. we, why are we fasting? Why are we, you know, trying to improve, right? <clears throat> Everybody out there that's, I mean, half this country is overweight. We're going to 50% of the country being obese in the next uh, five to 10 years, right? Like those are right. some staggering statistics, right? So like, what's the why? Why everybody wants to lose 10 pounds and fit into those old genes. Or if you don't, then that's fine. This probably isn't the right place for you. Or maybe we can convert you, right? But, um, <laughs> or there is hope there, but like the, the why are you doing it needs to go deeper than just to lose the weight, right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you're the, we, we talk about it in our challenges too, as, as far as what, what is your anchor? Anchoring to a strong why is a really important a really important thing um, and determines what what kind of decisions you actually make in the moment. So I, I think just as a matter of perspective and, and going deep and thinking about, um, you know, what what are your goals? What are you looking to achieve? Is it long term health? Is it is it short term, you know, losing a few pounds? But even beyond that, you, you know, what what happens next? What happens after you lose the 10 or 20 pounds? And and what are the next few decades of life look like? And, and just knowing that it doesn't take very much um, change in ha- in your habits to have a significant long term impact on on the trajectory of your whole life. And um yeah, I don't, I don't think there's anything to add to that. <laughs> like, yeah, I, I think I think that pretty much sums it up. So um, with that being said, uh, a couple of updates for you guys that have been with us. If you're new to fasting, go to our website and download the Fast Start Guide, thefastingforlife.com. Uh, we have another challenge coming up um, March 18th. That's correct, Tommy, March 18th. We have another 10-day yes. fasting challenge. Uh, be on the lookout for updates on that. Um, if you guys have any questions, please feel free to reach out to us at info at the fasting for life.com. Um, hopefully, uh, today's episode, <clears throat> um, yeah, hopefully today's episode is going to, going to be a little eye opening and, uh, give you a little bit more, uh, fuel for the fire, uh, when it's, when you're trying to make those, those, uh, lifestyle changes, which, which can be difficult at times. And one of the things that I personally love about what it is that we do, Tommy, is that this gives you back control. So you mm-hmm. don't no longer have to live, especially after 2020, where we've lost control of so much. I love that this you know, conversation that we had today can simply give you back that control and know um, that you can change the outcome. So as always, sir, uh, appreciate the time, appreciate the perspective, good yeah. conversation, and we'll talk soon. Absolutely. Thanks. Bye-bye. So you've heard today's episode and you may be wondering, where do I start? Head on over to thefastingforlife.com and sign up for our newsletter where you'll receive fasting tips and strategies to maximize results and fit fasting into your day-to-day life. While you're there, download your free Fast Start Guide to get started today. Don't forget to subscribe on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. Make sure to leave us a five-star review and we'll be back next week with another episode of Fasting for Life.